dedicated to quality job creation, another fundamental element uh, that will be uh, very important also to inspire the recovery strategy of the European Union. Another element very important from our point of view is the fact that uh, they are pushing forward a completely same time is not based on old fashioned neoliberal recipes but on the contrary on a more sustainable approach to the economy and also the fact that uh, after the US MCA trade agreement has been concluded the element about monitoring uh, working conditions and human rights uh, through trade agreements and making sure that they are respected also becomes key and crucial uh, in this new narrative all these elements are really important we have finally really appreciated the fact that uh, uh, Biden for the first time announced very clearly that they want to have uh, a 15 dollars minimum wage in the whole country this is really important and not only that he has also underlined very clearly that this administration will finally uh, defend trade union rights, uh, collective bargaining, the possibility for trade unions to organize in all over the country, something that has been hit and destroyed for decades in the United States. This is very useful also for Europe because this means that we can really create a sustainable level playing field in the global in the global dimension and this will reinforce also democratic cooperation in times of populism you know uh, reinforcing democracy also democracy on the ground in the economy in the labor market in the workplaces is for us very crucial yeah. secretary let me uh, just intervene for a moment and and by the way uh, apologies to our audience uh, it seemed like maybe there was trouble with the streaming because uh, it looked like in my end we were we were fully streaming but i saw from the comments that uh, some People were not seeing the uh, the screen, but I, I seem to think that we are should be fully working now. And, and one question I have, um, and, and I think I'll, I'll direct it to Minister Gulruth, uh, because it, uh, what we saw in the United States with the the emergence of uh, President Trump and his movement based on skepticism about uh, alliances uh, and a more robust nationalism, in some ways, it was. Uh, it was presaged uh, by uh, the, the, the uh, dispersion that we saw uh, in the European Union with the decision uh, 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 of uh, 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 voters to, to back Brexit. And, and of course, even with the United Kingdom, we're seeing tensions between uh, uh, the uh, w with many Scots and their uh, 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 tensions with London. So uh, do, are we now seeing that pendulum that was it looks more obvious in retrospect uh, than it did at the time, but clearly a, there was an international movement uh, in the 2015-16 the time period. Are we seeing that pendulum swing back the other direction? And, and does, do you think do you see Biden's victory as, as a, a sign of that pendulum? Thanks, John. That's a really good question. I think reflecting. Well, first of all, to from a Scottish perspective, um, which I'll, I'll give you obviously. Um, Obviously, the majority of people who live in Scotland did not vote for Brexit. So 62% of the population in Scotland voted to remain. And what Brexit has created is a tension in the constitutional makeup of the United Kingdom, which wasn't necessarily there in the same way in 2014. So it's changed the, the constitutional dimension of the debates we're having. And I should probably also say we have an election in Scotland seven weeks today. So we're living through some interesting times. To reflect on what that means, though, in terms of the you know, transatlantic relations and particularly with Biden's election, you, you are right to say that um, we had going back to 2016 in the June. So I was elected in the May and then we just had a Scottish election. We suddenly had a referendum. Nobody could have predicted that Brexit, I think, was going to be delivered. I mean, in Scotland, there's not really an anti-European feeling. And I remember being at the election count in Glenrothes, which is in my seat in Fife, and watching the numbers come in, and I think the first seat was Sunderland in the north of England, and we could not believe it that people had voted for this. And a lot of my family live in London, and of course London voted to remain as well. So it was a real feeling that this is really odd, this is happening. And then a month later, actually, I was in the States on a trip with work, and we went to um, four different states and met with lots of different people. And nobody we met and no one we spoke to was voting for Donald Trump. 
And that was in July 2016. And I found that really interesting reflecting on it. And then, of course, in November of that year, watching the result come through and actually the American consulate in Edinburgh had put on an event here and some of us had gone along to watch the results come in. And again, it was exactly that same feeling of watching these results and thinking, this isn't borne out by you know, the, the people I was speaking to. This isn't borne out by the, the folk we had conversations with. Not a single person in all these meetings we'd had in the States said they were voting for Trump. And it's the same for the kind of Brexiteers. There's almost this kind of shyness maybe or an embarrassment that that's what they voted for. Um, and certainly in Scotland, there aren't that many Brexiteers you could argue, and perhaps that's part of it. But then um, there are people who passionately believe that they are, are better off out of the European Union. I'm not one of them and neither is my party. But there was a, a huge political you know, challenge put to the UK and to the States in 2016. And whether or not Biden's election means the pendulum is swinging back, I sincerely hope so. Um, we saw at the end of last year the conclusion of the transition period. Of course, the transition period, um, which from a Scottish government perspective, we had made uh, representations to the UK government to get them to extend that because we didn't think it should be happening in a global pandemic. But we are where we are. We're now having to deal with some pretty difficult um, choices in Scotland. And of course, the people will have uh, ultimately a choice to make on Scotland's future in seven weeks' time. But in terms of that pendulum swinging back, I hope so. I very much hope so. Yeah. Minister Bell, let me ask you this. Uh, usually when we, uh, historically, when we talked about uh, a transatlantic partnership, we were talking about the United States and Western Europe aligned by values and also a very shared uh, uh, military interest in particular vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Soviet Union. Um, now, of course, that's not been the prism through which we've viewed transatlantic uh, relations for the next generation. But we are now seeing the emergence of China as being a focal point, uh, uh, certainly in the, from the U.S. perspective. It's one place where the parties are in general alignment as, as seen uh, Beijing as, as being uh, uh, primarily an adversary, uh, both commercial and in, in security terms. But uh, my sense is that uh, uh, that uh, old uh, the, many voices in Europe are not eager for the old us against them paradigm with respect to China, that they see this as a um, uh, see this view this differently than it is viewed in Washington. Uh, and uh, um, I'd be curious your view. How is a, a, a transatlantic partnership that's based uh, uh, principally around uh, the, the West's relationship with China, uh, how is that going to work? Um, uh, and how is it going to be different than the way we used to think of transatlantic relations in the past? Yes. So um, I think even among Europeans, you might have some... Um, let's say, different views about uh, China. Although, generally speaking, uh, maybe we do not speak the, the kind of um, attitude of us and them. I know that the U.S. maybe has, um, I dare say, completely different view about uh, China and uh, relationships with, with Beijing on a number of issues. Uh, I can understand that. I mean, uh, we are not a military superpower or, or economic power. I mean, we uh, are uh, the smallest member state in the European Union. So the way we look at things um, is also due to our not only geographic position in the middle of the Mediterranean, but also due to our size. Uh, so I can understand that at the global level, the U.S., and um, China, together with others, of course, or a handful of other countries, have greater ambitions uh, to to put their mark, so to speak, on, on the rest of the world. Um, from our perspective, even because um, we have um, relations with that go back to a number of years now, uh, more than 40 years, actually, um, we also we always had this relationship built on trust in the sense that we never look at uh, Maltese Chinese relationship as as if they wanted to dominate our country uh, but it was also uh, there was and there is uh, mutual respect irrespective of who was in government actually um, so generally speaking then uh, at the European level, 
Um, I think the feeling is that um, economies should not fight each other, but work more together rather than... Uh, Luca mentioned the issue of trade wars. I believe that with trade wars, everyone in the medium to long term will lose. You might have some gains uh, in the short term, maybe, but medium to long term, with trade wars, I think everyone has to lose rather than 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 to gain. And with China, it's the same, I believe, that uh, we should work together. China is the uh, second largest economy in the world. At times it's first or go, soon going to be first, it depends. Um, so I don't think that uh, we... Uh, should talk about trade wars or economic wars with with China. Uh, yes, we have our differences. If we speak about certain values, if we, we speak about how um, about democracy, about whatever we, you, you wish to, to speak, we have our differences. But by not talking to each other or by not working with each other, we will not solve any of the issues. So I think there is more to gain. Um, if we continue with our discussions, if we will continue also to work together um, rather than avoid each other or uh, not not working at all with each other. So um, from this perspective, I think this is one of the items that maybe Europe and the US uh, will, uh, will debate. And I don't think that we are going to reach a consensus uh, very soon in the sense that we have to respect each other's position. Uh, and uh, continue to work together irrespective of maybe the difference that exists between uh, US-China relationships or EU-China uh, relationship. So, Secretary Vesentini, address that. What, what is going to uh, be the, 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 the most difficult issues vis-a-vis uh, China, where the US perspective might be different than uh, the most common European perspective? What, what are the hard issues coming up? Well, you know, China has invested enormous quantities of money uh, in Europe uh, in the last uh, decade, uh, becoming the owner even of uh, uh, public infrastructures in some cases. Uh, And uh, the problem is that uh, uh, Europe, the European Union in particular, uh, have been left uh, alone in facing this aggressive investment policy coming from China by this trade war approach from the Trump administration, as Carmelo rightly pointed out. I mean, this this attitude of uh, Trump to, uh, let's say, closing uh, uh, his, his own policy all within the borders uh, and the interests of the U.S., uh, uh, having this big fight against China, to some extent also against Russia and other big players, uh, uh, all this has destroyed the, the traditional alliances that existed in the past between Europe and the U.S., uh, and these alliances were fundamental elements of rebalancing. And this has created, unfortunately, uh, uh, all the conditions for this aggressive policy of investment coming from China that has also disrupted significantly uh, a fundamental level playing field when it comes to protection of the environment and, again, protection of social and labor rights. Uh, And this is, by by the way, the the conclusion of this uh, uh, negative uh, spiral, downward spiral, I would say, was the fact that uh, the European Union concluded an agreement on investment a few days before the uh, Biden administration started, Uh, an agreement on which we as the trade unions have a very negative uh, uh, assessment because this agreement uh, doesn't address all the problems uh, of uh, unfair competition that China brings to Europe in terms of the environment, social rights, human rights. Well, let, me and so on. So, let me intervene there. Let me intervene just for a moment because there is, uh, and ask uh, Minister Gulworth, uh, and, and there's a, co- uh, a comment here uh, uh, that, that I'm actually quite sympathetic to uh, from Richard uh, Godwin. He's with uh, Starbridge uh, Venture Capital. And he says that uh, the U.S. forgets that it is not the sum total of Western civilization uh, and needs to rebuild its alliances. And, and Minister, do you think the uh, new administration is in for a surprise that uh, um, during this period of disengagement, actually China, through its financial investment and and, and, uh, perhaps through its diplomatic engagement, has actually uh, um, changed the nature that the the Biden administration might find a new Europe? 
Um, yeah. The U.S. has been focused on itself. I think that's an interesting point, John. I mean, I think U.S. and uh, China's kind of strategic rivalry is not new. And I think, you know, for the future, well, for the Biden administration, building back some of the bridges that the Trump administration essentially burnt down will be not without its challenges. And it probably is going to take longer than his four year term. Um but I think we, for the US and China to collectively, kind of collectively work together in terms of tackling issues like climate change, which we've already touched upon, and as P5 members of the UN Security Council, we really need them to work together to support that rules-based international system and strengthen international institutions. And I touched on this at the start of the conversation, but the pandemic really, I think, brings into sharp relief that need for global solidarity and about open communication, international cooperation not firing off tweets which potentially start wars for example so there's a an opportunity i think for biden to build back some of those bridges but you're right it won't be without its challenges and of course the european union's relationship with china is pretty well documented and um, i am um, a pretty avid listener of political's podcasts and um, was listening recently and um, to some of what's been going on with regard to merkel's involvement in terms of um, that china relationship with the eu and um looking to strengthen those ties. And of course, I think there was a comment made um, by one of the US, if it wasn't commentators, um, at the start of the same week, this is a couple of months ago now, trying to speak out against that. So the politics is almost being conducted at the moment because of the pandemic via Twitter or online. there's touched upon human rights violation what's happening in Xinjiang is hugely concerning we've spoken out about that in Scotland and we really need um countries like the states and others to to do likewise and I think that respect for human rights and the rule of law is one of those kind of guiding principles that we should be united on and um, we need to uh, ensure that where that's happening human rights violations and um, that something is said and that action ultimately is taken as well so Yeah, I wonder if I could, we might switch um, and we can return to China, uh, certainly, um, but, but just briefly get you uh, to engage uh, the other really, it seems to me, new big actors, which is, is not a nation state like China, but the, the emergence of technology firms, which in some ways I have the, the kind of power of nation states. If you look at the pervasiveness of Google or, or of Amazon or Facebook, and one of the notable things, uh, to me anyway, is that Europe has actually been much more creative and much more uh, interventionist in regulating uh, these uh, largely U.S.-based uh, firms uh, than, than the United States is uh, uh, is doing. How do you think? Uh, where do the where does the role of, of making sure that these uh, technology firms are uh, are, are instruments of, uh, of uh, transparency and connection and, and the betterment of individual lives as opposed to instruments of surveillance and manipulation uh, of people. Where is that going to uh, to play in in the uh, the future of, of a trust-based transatlantic alliance? Um, uh, Minister uh, Abella, maybe you could address that. Yes, thank you for the easy question. Um, <laughs> actually, this is, uh, I think, one of the challenges that we, all of us are facing. Uh, at times, uh, the big technology uh, uh, companies might be seen more powerful than certain governments, actually. Uh, it is, I think, uh, at times very difficult to regulate um, uh, as well. Um, it's a question also of jurisdiction and, uh, and, uh, and you know, um, that might, might, be, might be the case in certain instances. However, definitely then, if we move forward from the issue of regulation or uh, the strength of the big technology companies, uh, technology is here to stay. Uh, technology is here to stay and evolve. And I think that most of the economies are uh, working to be actually built on technology. So definitely uh, the use of technology is not only imperative, but is also important for economic growth in a number of especially developed countries. And the challenge is uh, for uh, 
countries that are developing to uh, keep the pace with developing countries. Otherwise, the divide will continue to grow rather than to, to decrease. Um, we know that we have, uh, for example, the 5G issue uh, in terms of the next uh, technology um, that uh, we are, or most of us, are aspiring to have. Um, maybe this was also uh, some kind of divergence between Europe and the US when it comes to 5G technology. Um, it's not um, available from an, a, a number of, country, uh, of companies, actually. So uh, most of the time we had to turn our um, face to, uh, to China as well also five, for 5G technology. Um, so I think when it comes to technology, yes, I think we should acknowledge that we have our challenges when it comes to um, regulation, as I said in the beginning. But we know that we um, need also uh, to work together on the issue of uh, developing technology uh, and also this digital transition. Uh, of our economies and uh, societies, actually, that uh, we are uh, we are having. So it's crucial, for example, to include critical infrastructure uh, as well. Um, and of course, then there is the issue of cybersecurity and the threats that emerge from technology. But this is like everything else. You have the positive side and then you have the challenges or the negative side of it. I think we need to work together to uh, reduce the number of uh, threats that can emerge from technology to, due to uh, cybersecurity issues. Um, and then there is the, also the issue of sovereignty. Um, whether if we become, let's say, if not completely, but very close to it, dependent on technology, uh, then basically some might argue that, you know, um, the future of a country depends uh, on on how uh, uh, you use technology, but also the risks that emanate from from this the same use. Secretary Vicentini, do you trust the to the theme of our our uh, our panel? Do you trust that the Biden administration will be looking out broadly? Uh, for the uh, 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 the interests of, of uh, European citizens as well as American citizens, and, and specifically your area of interest, uh, the the interests of workers generally, or, or do you worry that as it addresses issues that we've been talking about, China and technology, that it's going to be looking out uh, for the interests of American workers, uh, possibly at the expense of uh, uh, of European consumers or European laborers? How will we know that they deserve trust? What are the issues you'll be well, looking at? Well, this is to be seen, of course. Uh, some of the announcements that the Biden administration has done so far go towards the, inter the protection of interest of workers, but it's, of course it's not clear to what extent uh, it's only for American workers or if there is uh, uh, a vision that goes a bit beyond all this, uh, uh, building alliances at the global level, including with Europe, uh, to make sure that we can really create a level playing field at global level. What, is, where, where will the test be? How will we know that it, it's the, the commitment is to the interests of labor broadly rather than just uh, uh, maneuvering well, from the narrow well, advantage? Well, you know, well, you know the, the element that you mentioned of the multinational companies in the digital and uh, IT sector is a, is a very good test. Uh, because on this, I think uh, uh, the European Union has something to show uh, to the US. The fact that the European Union has decided to take initiatives to make the multinational companies in this sector to pay taxes first, where they produce their profits, uh, to make sure that they respect labor rights, second, and third, that uh, to make sure they respect uh, human and democratic rights and uh, privacy and data protection of people, well, uh, is to be seen if uh, the U.S. will do the same. So this is a typical example well, where we can really see if uh, the promises and the announcements that the American administration has done so far can really become reality in a global perspective. Another element is the one I was mentioning before about trade. Uh, uh, as I said, Europe was abandoned by Trump. Now we have to see if uh, Europe and the US can build a new alliance uh, to make sure that we can have a fair 
trade uh, in the global dimension. There are some tests that can be done very soon, you know, in this respect. Uh, Mr. Gilworth, let me ask you, uh, the, you know, if, when it comes to rhetoric and uh, sort of general good intentions, it, it's clear that uh, uh, President Biden has a very different orientation than President Trump uh, uh, has. But it seems to me from the European perspective, you would not just want to uh, depend on good intentions alone. You would want to make sure that you're in a position of power and of leverage. Um, um, uh, what is the uh, European leverage? Um, what are the, those leverage points uh, when it comes to the relationship uh, uh, with the United States? Uh, seems to me a, a strong partnership is strongest when there's actual uh, 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 shared interests and the ability to enforce those interests. Absolutely. So, I mean, in terms of, so you, you spoke there, John, about rhetoric and good intentions, and um, I, su- I guess that's where we are at the moment um, in terms of the being the early days of the new administration. But the the key area would be from a European perspective on trade, um, and we have seen some of the challenges from a Scottish perspective that. Trump's um, tariffs on whiskey, for example, brought to bear on the on the whiskey sector. And I have a couple of distilleries in my own constituency who were pretty badly hit by those taxes. Now it's great that they're not they're going to go away under the new administration. That's really progress, I think. But for in terms of leverage, I suppose it's about working together as opposed to having leverage over each other. And in the past, this kind of populism that we've seen under Trump, but also with Brexit means that countries or the EU is pitted against um, each other. And I don't think that's healthy for democracy. Um, And Biden's approach is supposed to reflect on how he dealt with the result and the former president's challenging of the result was to be very calm, very rational and say that democracy would win through. And I think there's something about that approach that should teach all politicians a lesson. And we were certainly watching um, very carefully in Scotland about how Biden dealt with a real challenge to his authority, legitimate authority to become the next president in a democratic state like the US. And watching the scenes um, at the the Capitol um, really, I think, shocked the world, shocked people certainly uh, on the continent, certainly in the UK as well. Because we looked at these scenes and thought, if that can happen in America, that can probably happen anywhere. So the the kind of demystification to some extent of American democracy and then contrasting what had happened with where we are now. Um, you, you know, we're, we're so it's a it's a better world, undoubtedly, under a Biden administration. But I think we have to learn the lessons from some of what happened. And we've seen in recent times and some of the responses you might be aware to um, an issue that's happened in the UK um, around a a woman who was, um, we think, although there hasn't been a trial yet, murdered. Um, The response from some of the protest groups in the UK to go out and to protest and the police response to that has been quite difficult um, at times, has been disproportionate at times. And I think there is a challenge to democracies such as the UK's and the states in terms of how they are perceived across the world. So, um, yeah, you're right when you talk about rhetoric and good intentions, but it's also, I suppose, about stepping up to your international obligations and showing the world who you really are. And to me, Trump, his his last words or his last actions as president in terms of encouraging protesters to come and take on the, the Capitol building will never be forgotten. That's his kind of legacy now. So moving away from that, it's for Biden, of course, to decide whether or not it's just rhetoric uh, or is it going to be more than that? Is it going to be tangible action? And I think we have already started to see some of that shift. Minister Abella, did the events in the United States, the uh, insurrection at the Capitol and the general dysfunction that's been on display uh, really for several years, but uh, seemed to be acute in the period following the election. Did that change your view of the United States and what its fundamental values are or its, the, its fundamental trustworthiness as a, as a partner? Actually, I, I was shocked at the scenes that were happening. Um, and as, as Jenny was saying, I mean, um, it didn't give... Um, let's say, a positive outlook um, to a country that uh, most in the world look up to. So um, I think it doesn't uh, definitely serve as something um, that, uh, you know, uh, inspires uh, that 
what was happening was somehow uh, democratic, not at all, actually. Um, so I think it... it uh, you asked the question whether personally I, I um, sort of have a different vision of, of the U.S. Uh, the actions of a few, I don't think that should, uh, generally speaking, uh, change your mindset or, or make you believe that all Americans are uh, those who we saw attack the, the Capitol Hill or, or take that kind of, of, of uh, stance, actually. So uh, I was shocked, but I know that the U.S. stands for values. I know that... Uh, generally speaking, the, the U.S. Are, um, were against what was happening. Um, so I think that is a chapter that needs we need to learn lessons from it. Um, first and foremost, I think, in, in the country where these actions happened. But uh, I agree with what Jenny said, that uh, it should be an eye-opener for all of us that uh, something like that might happen uh, hopefully not, or God forbid, uh, in our respective countries as well. So we should work for democracy each and every day. We should be for the rule of law each and every day. We should have, uh, finally, we should respect one, one another, even if we, if we do not agree, uh, even personally and individually. Um, and we should work for that each and every day to, to prevent something like this to happen uh, somewhere else as well. You know, we've, um, well, let's see, we've got a question here and we've got just a few minutes left. So maybe we, uh, um, we can, uh, uh, address, uh, Alain uh, Paul Martin's, uh, uh, question here. Uh, he, he's, uh, with the Harvard University, uh, uh, uh global system. Um, he says, uh, and as I said, we've got just a couple minutes. So why don't we go around the table with this? Uh, would it be fair to consider Biden's first hundred days, uh, uh, privileging his constituencies and focusing on the pandemic as essential compromise. Uh, uh, let me see it if you get the heart of this. Cause it's kind of a long question. Uh, well, the, the, it looks like the, that he is uh, trying to build a new coalition first in the United States and then to carry that coalition of, uh, uh, of moderates and uh, of people who basically share his, uh, his values about the, 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 the importance of alliances. Um, uh, what's the sequencing? And does this start with the uh, work at home to rebuild a center of the United States and then you carry it abroad? Uh, if I may paraphrase the question or, or, or uh, do these things happen simultaneously? The, the, the fundamental question is how do we rebuild a center both in the United States and importantly, a, a center in, uh, um, uh, 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 in the Western Alliance? Uh, uh, Go ahead and, and, and tackle that. Maybe Minister Goldworth, what, does the center hold and, and what tangible steps does Biden need to take in the near term and medium term uh, to, to rebuild that center? Thank you, John. I'll be very brief because I, I have to go to vote at six o'clock, um, yeah. but I'm voting on my computer. So um, we're remote voting today. So um, with regard to rebuilding from the centre, yeah, I think you're right. I, I think um, I'm not an American. I don't live in America, so I am an outsider looking in, as it were. I haven't been in the States since 2017. I love it every time I visit. I love speaking to people about their views and they're always very keen to do that. I think um, the division, though, the dividing line in American politics between Democrat and Republican has been exacerbated by Trump's presidency. We know that. Um, and Biden has to, you're right, I think, heal the wounds at home first before he starts to think about this international coalition. But what I would say as a small uh, as a minister in a small country of Scotland, um, looking at what's happening is America has a huge role to play still on the global stage. Um, people look to America, they look to America for their vision of what democracy should look like and to set a standard for everyone else. So um, however he takes that work forward, there will be people who want to work with him. The European Union are keen to work with him. And in Scotland, we're keen to do that too. So um, I'm going to pause there, John. Apologies, because I have to go and click a button. To vote. Very um, much. Thank you very much for having me thank along. Uh, and I hope our paths cross soon. And, and uh, we'll go briefly uh, as we say goodbye uh, to Mr. Gilruth, uh, briefly to Minister uh, Bella and, and to uh, to the Secretary. Uh, um, what does the, 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 the future look like? So I, I would like to, to, to uh, answer your question as well. 